You're listening to Beyond Technique, the podcast that empowers photographers to bring their businesses to the next level. Hello and welcome to Beyond Technique, brought to you by Platypod, Photofocus, and Skip Cohen University. This is Shamira Young, and I'm joined by my co-host and magician of marketing, Skip Cohen. Whoa, magician of marketing could be good or bad. <laughs> Two of the companies that I worked for in my life have just about disappeared. Now, would that be a magical if I can make if I can make companies disappear? Actually, <laughs> Polaroid was one of them, and I and I plead the fifth. I had nothing to do with any of the problems. Oh goodness, I'm talking so, good magic for yes. you. Strictly good yeah, magic. Good magic. <laughs> hey, Shamara, this is so much fun having Beyond Technique back and it's growing and we've got a new partner being Platypod and I'm really excited about being able to share more podcasts and different kinds of subjects but I'm even more excited about using Platypod and so far I've been blown away by the diversity not to mention the quality of the product but diversity wise uh, I talked to a photographer and videographer this morning who wants to use it in his studio and use the Platypod Max um, to hold one of his one of his lights in the studio mounted to the wall? Uh, I've used it as a microphone stand when I need a very very low angle, where I've literally got it on a top of a small wall and I'm on the other side of the wall and I don't have any room to be able to use a tripod. Yeah, you know this is very cool. This is a lot of fun. I just got mine a couple days ago. And I'm super excited because I have several nature areas, trails that I love to walk through. And here in Port Huron, we've got a ton of those. And with this, with the platypod, I don't need to carry a heavy tripod with me. It's solid enough to set on different surfaces. Plus, Suzette Allen is on the road. Suzette and Johnny are on the road with the bubble trailer tour. And platypod is a partner in that. And Suzette is going to be, you're going to see Platypod, if you follow Suzette, you're going to see Platypod tied to a tree when they've got <laughs> Bubble Trailer out in some of the parks. I can only guess the places that Platypod is going to wind up and how it's going to be used in terms of capturing images. So it's really fun having a new partner for Beyond Technique and being able to share some great ideas in terms of expanding your creativity. Right. This is very cool. Very cool. So listen, we've got... We've got a fun one today, yes. and if you're good, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do our intro. Let's get to it. We're going to go well beyond technique, love that play on the title, and we're going to talk about the importance of education, mentoring, helping photographers grow their skill set, but outside of camera technique, but in business, pricing, and especially a little bit in diversity of their specialty. J.P. Morgan is in the house, and this is great. Uh, he's primarily known as a commercial photographer, but he's doing so many more things these days from when he and I first met way back when I was with Hasselblad. Now, back then, JP was creating some incredible images, shooting film on Hollywood sets, and he was doing things that today nobody could even figure out without Photoshop. Now, we've got some of his classic images that are featured with the blog post, but JP is an artist, he's a photographer, he's an author, filmmaker, educator, um, and I'm probably leaving out a few other hats that he wears. So JP, if I haven't screwed up technology here, this is the cue for your lips to move. Welcome to Beyond <laughs> Technique. Well, thank you very much, uh, Skip and Shamara. It's great to be here. It truly is. So, that, uh, you know, that sounded exciting, the stuff I was doing back in the day. I'll have to look at that again here. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I was on your site the other day, and it's in that category under classics. And somewhere, somewhere in a file in my office, I've got a set of eight by tens you gave me that uh, one of them I think had, is it possible it had a young Tom Hanks in it? Uh, very possible. Yeah. Oh my familiar. Goodness. It yep. was, I don't remember yep. if it was the site, um, the set rather for big, but it was one of the, and one of his early movies yeah one of his early things on hollywood sets that i mean you were turning furniture upside down you were taking the whole set and yeah. turning it around it was a fun time one of the first ones i did in that whole genre was i uh shot will be uh, goldberg on an earthquake set the set splitting apart and stuff's flying around and uh she had just gotten started and i think her first film and uh, that was a lot of fun she was fun the set was fun 
uh, just kind of very kind of like a frozen moment. It's almost a kind of feature film ish, you know, Norman Rockwell meets the far side and, uh, but there's this frozen moment of things happening. So it was a lot of fun to do. It really, truly was. Well, it's so much fun looking at your at your work today and knowing what your work was like when we first met. And that's, a, I won't even go into how long ago it was, but it was all pre-digital and, you have managed to absolutely follow that rule of keep changing and keep growing and to see how much you have. And we're going to talk about it today in terms of um, mentoring, online education. There's so many different things you're doing to help photographers raise the bar. And that's that's what makes Beyond Technique podcast so much fun because we're not going to get into, you know, all right, how did you set up the shot and what lighting and f-stops and everything else? Yeah, well, there's so much more to photography than that. I mean, even though people think that is photography and all there is to talk about, there it is so much deeper than that. The water is much deeper than that. So, so here we go. We're jump. We're diving in. Right? Absolutely. We're diving in. And you know, I'm over here still swooning over the mention of uh, Tom Cruise. However, <laughs> oh, I said, did I say Tom Cruise? Because I meant no, to say Tom, Tom Hanks. Hanks. Tom Hanks still swooning, still swooning over here. <laughs> so you know, before we dive into the meat of our conversation, which I can't wait to get into it first, JP, could you share with us just a bit, a bit more about your background and how you ended up doing what you're doing today? Absolutely, I'd love to. You know, I started off, I went to Art Center College of Design in Pasadena in Los Angeles, and uh, I always had a desire. I'm from Idaho originally and had no desire to ever go back to Idaho. I mean, to visit maybe, but uh, not to live or to work. I definitely want to be in Hollywood and in kind of Los Angeles. Uh, the production scene here was very exciting to me. And I just fell in love with Norman Rockwell. I fell in love with uh, The Far Side. I was uh, just really loved the work of Reed Miles, Jim Wood, uh, Barbara Bordnick. I mean, they're, they're, those photographers were doing, uh, Barbara wasn't, but, uh, but uh, Reed and uh, Reed Miles was, Jim Wood was doing this kind of Norman Rockwell stuff. And I used to look at that when I was in school and I was thinking, you know, it's fun. I'd love to do it. I'd love to shoot that kind of stuff. But I want to do something that's a little weirder than that. It has a little bit of a sense. Of course, the far side was, was strong at that point. And I kept reading the far side and I started thinking, you know, I just want my images to be funny. I want them to be interesting. I want them to be a little off. And so I think that kind of mixed up into a, a world of the far side meets Norman Rockwell. And of course, I love to build sets and things. So it just became a physical uh, kind of uh, way to solve problems. We would create sets to solve visual problems. And it was a lot of fun to do. Large kind of set production. Do you remember what, I'm, I'm curious, what was your first paid assignment? Right out of school, or one of your first? One of my first? Um, you know, I had shot an image uh, for uh, this lady holding on. We built the set so it was on its end. So the lady's actually holding on to the ceiling, and her little son is hanging onto her leg, and her husband's, uh, his shoulders on the floor. When I say husband, it was literally a couple and their child. But when you turn it horizontally, it looks like she's being blown out of the kitchen. I'd sent that out to to you know, several places. Then I met a lady who said, put it in the black book. So I stuck it in the black book. I'd never been in the black book before. I was getting little teeny kind of jobs. Nothing really, you know, it was really more like stuff that, I don't know. But anyway, I got a call from, uh, from uh, Domino saying, hey, we saw this shot in the black book. We'd love to have you do this image for us. You know, do you have any time, you know, coming up in the next month or so? And I'm going, I got nothing but time. <laughs> Let me see I'm if I can there. work you in. Yeah. yeah, let me see what I can do. But, you know, I was just perceived as being so much further along in the beginning of my career because we'd invested so much money and, and time into creating these large production pieces when I was at Art Center. So I left with a pretty strong portfolio, and I'm just very blessed in that way. And I think I found myself early at Art Center, and... And I have an incredibly supportive uh, spouse and who is an art director, and she and I would build the sets, and, and she would get the wardrobe and prop things. And I remember an art director once saying, I love this image because all of the furniture and the things are just like that Midwestern kind of just tacky stuff. It's just wonderful. And I'm thinking, yeah, it all came from my house, everything in there. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, and that's, it was really the beginning. And, uh, and so those projects started to come. You know, we were very blessed in that. Well, for those listeners who are too young to know what the Black Book was, 
Yeah, as you exactly. know, the piece of history. <laughs> there was a time, this is pre-internet, and yep. the black book was very expensive to be in. I think, am I right, JP, it went quarter page, half page, or full page, or double yes. page spread. Yep. And every ad agency in the world had this black book. It was the Bible of talent. So yep. when you were looking for a photographer, you literally went to the index. If you were looking for somebody to tabletop food, you could search it that way. You could search it by um, area of the country, by photo style. And it was it was a gigantic. I mean, am I right? It was probably four to six inches thick. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, very large and a weird yeah. shape. It was like uh, you know six inches wide and and twelve or eighteen inches, twelve inches tall yeah. or something. It was an interesting size. Um, but you know, it was so much easier to to find talent in that uh, era. Not because they were easier to find. It was just because less of them were available, and you right. it was a lot. You know, it just kind of narrowed everything down. Whereas now, with everything on the internet and Instagram and everything else, it's like you're just you're just buried in talent. You know, buried in people who are out there trying to make themselves known and and to stand out. It's a much different market. Well, that was the black book, and the black book, I I think it disappeared. I'm not sure. Oh, where, yeah. to, where do agencies go today when they want to go online? Any idea who the leader is? Boy, I'm not really sure. I don't know the answer to that question. No, I don't know. We'll have to tr we'll have to go research it. Well, let's Plus, let's let's head over to the to one of the main topics I want to talk about, because one of the hats that you wear today is definitely a leader in online education, and one of the things over the years that I've seen repeatedly, um, even in fact I've talked about this I think once or twice on previous podcasts, but Don Blair was in his mid seventies and was still going to every possible workshop he could because you never stop learning. And in today's market to be competitive, you've got to have the skill set. And I'm just curious about, about how and when you felt that, let's go take my skill set and my network and let's see what we can do to build a, a great educational empire because you really have, there's an awful lot of content and it's all good, solid content um, that I was looking through on the on the videos and going through the slanted lens this morning. Well, that that process was an interesting kind of uh, journey for me because I had an art director friend who just said, "You know what? You do such fun images, and you have some film background. Why don't you, you know, create a little video about one of your, uh, you know, shoots and put it up on YouTube? It's a new thing that's just happening." <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, "Well, sure, you know." So I shot one and we put it up and you know places like f-stoppers and, and several of those places picked it up and it got a tremendous amount of exposure and and so when we would shoot uh, we would put things up and so in the beginning it truly was in its its basic form it was my life's photographic journey if i was shooting a corporate portrait then the lesson was about corporate portraits if i was doing a big set production piece it was about some aspect of special effects or lighting or something that was uh, with regards to the, set, the shoot we were actually doing. So it really was the stuff we were doing. It wasn't that we were brainstorming on topics or it was the, the photo life we were living. Um, photo and video. I mean, we, we do a tremendous amount of video. I, I either direct or DP direct or just DP. So there's a whole combination there of video that we've shot over the years, which spawned out of our uh, the large set production stuff we did because we had built such large sets. A lot of my clients would say, can you shoot me a commercial on this? And so we would start, we started shooting commercials and doing a lot of commercial work back in the nineties and the two thousands. And so that kind of, that's how the educational thing happened. I mean, it's kind of grown into its own world now. And my, my desire for it has certainly grown because it is really satisfying when I meet someone that I have kind of helped mentor and direct in their career and, they're super successful. I mean, there's nothing more satis satisfying than that, really. It's been a it's been a great journey and seeing people to be able to progress. And when I get emails saying, "I just love what you do. It's helped me so much," and you know, you know it really makes it worthwhile. So, oh, that's so cool. That's so cool. And have you noticed any trends as far as where photographers are struggling or needing the most help? You know, it's fascinating because I've seen these trends kind of uh, kind of come and go a little bit. Um, I've we have really gone through an era and are I think turning the corner uh, in a pretty strong way where the non-technical window light um, you know uh, kind of shooters were really the thing 
and beautiful work, uh, great perspective. But I'm seeing now that the market's starting to turn a little bit and we're becoming a little more strobe oriented again and a little more uh, focused on creating images rather than just finding uh, the light. So I, I'm seeing that direction. Instagram has certainly come on super strong. I was at photo um, or at uh, Shutterfest in in St. Louis this last year. I spoke there and and I was thrilled at the number of women. It was like 58 or 60 percent women who were there at that conference, and so a very strong representation. And and you see it in the work. You know, you see a different perspective and a, and a great kind of perspective that's emerging in the market because of that that force. So I think we're going to see uh, the the technicality, uh, you know, people becoming a little more directed towards strobes and controlling light. And I think that will start to change the, the market into a little bit of a hybrid between that, that natural kind of found light and some more control. So it'll be interesting to see how that emerges. Well, I love it when I meet somebody who tells me that they are a natural light specialist, <laughs> which we all know that's redefined. That means they're afraid of studio lighting. Yeah, exactly. So they're not they're they're not doing anything. And the truth <laughs> is, we all like natural light. I mean, if you look sure. at some of Sue Bryce's work, she's using um, studio lighting to create a natural light look, which is all part of the the technique and the skill set. And it always it just amazes me when somebody has chosen to keep their work very restricted, um, essentially to you know sweet light. Yep. Yeah, well, no, I don't shoot that time of day outside because you can't yeah. get a good shot. Well, <laughs> excuse me, what do you do when you've got a client? And what do you do when you've got a location where you just don't have that, that you know, gorgeous sunlight? Uh, just before the podcast, everybody, we were talking about an old mutual friend, Dean Collins. And Dean used to talk about the only difference between the sun and your studio strobes is recycle time. Yeah, <laughs> which, I, which I always like that. That's a great. So, great if, if we stay on the topic of education, mm -hmm. um, let's talk about let's talk about your ability to mentor. What do you What do you look for? I mean, what happens when you get somebody that just doesn't have the skill set yet, but they want they want to work with you and they want you to be their their mentor? What are you looking for when when you're offering your services under under a mentoring umbrella? You know, it's fascinating because. I think that skill set is the least important quality. And as I say that, it'll freak most people out. I love that. <laughs> it's like, it just is. Well, you know, it's fascinating because I, I tell people, I know photographers across, across the United States that I have worked with who really, I would say, do not have incredible skill sets. And in some ways, I think that's almost not the most important attribute you can have to be successful in this industry. But you do have to have a show up on time, business kind of personality, give good solid work. The work doesn't have to be the best work in the world, but it has to be a solid work. And I tell everybody, it's kind of like dating or marriage, I guess. There's somebody for everybody. And so you may not be the person who's going to shoot for the biggest agencies in New York City, but you can be and create a great photo business and find clients who will be thrilled with the kind of work that you do. So I think we, we, think, we look at this industry too much on a, the 1%, uh, the 5%, the 10% maybe of the absolute best there is out there. And I think there's a gamut of really successful people who are making great money and, and uh, living excellent lives and contributing creatively and may not be the most creative people in the world. So I love getting hold of one of those and helping them create the business structure that they need and help them create the portfolio that they need and then get out there and to, and to work it. You know, you can have an incredible portfolio. You can have an amazing portfolio. And if you just won't engage and, and find work and work on your business, then you're just not going to succeed. And so that's really, that's what I want. Somebody who's going to work on their business. Well, you and I share a mutual buddy with Tony Corbell. Mm -hmm. And I remember Tony talking at one particular workshop about when he first started. He wasn't the best photographer in town, but he was determined to be the nicest. <laughs> and if you follow all of Tony's career, yeah. um, the only difference today is he's still the nicest, but he's also one of the very best. <laughs> and so right. he kept growing his skill set all along, constantly growing, constantly learning. And it, it is about that. I mean, it, we've talked on other podcasts about the importance of relationship building, and that's your most important marketing tool today. And it's not it's not always 
the design of your website and the quality of your work. It's about relationship building. It's about getting to know the client. It's about listening more than talking. It's about really understanding and seeing what the client needs and then meeting that needs or better yet, exceeding yeah. those needs. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I, I shot something on Monday and it was late and the client said, I really need these by Wednesday morning. And I, I mean, when I say yes, there is no other option. Sleep is not an option. You know, there's nothing, it, it has to be done. You have to be careful when you say yes, but when you say yes, you got to, you got to make it happen. And I think you're absolutely right. The service to clients and, and really just creating an experience that they're going to feel comfortable with. And when they come back, they know they're going to be taken care of. So. For the photographers out there who are listening and maybe they haven't focused on these customer service skills, because you're right, they are so important and they really essentially help you stand out. It can be a great differentiator from your business, uh, mm -hmm. your business compared to others. So for those who are listening who may not know where to start, is there one particular skill, um, service skill that you think is the most important that they should start focusing on? Well, it, it's interesting because I really focus on two things when I start with people. One is this thing called the daily routine for success where I want them to get into the habit of certain things they have to do every day that will uh, get new work. And in that process, they all have, also have certain things they need to do every day to make sure that they keep their clients taken care of. You know, the clients should hear from you at a certain, you know, a certain time. So it's that kind of client connection. So I try to get people on this sense of thinking about – uh, stop freaking out about how good my work is and start concentrating on how important your clients are. Uh, and once you can do that, it makes a huge difference. It's all about relationships, like you said. Yep. Absolutely. Moving from mentoring, because we've talked a little bit of educa education, we've talked about mentoring. One of the things that I love when I look at your online programming relates to diversity and one of the ones that I, I noticed right away was um, one of your online programs on food photography. And God, I just I wish I could take every new wedding photographer out there <laughs> and make it mandatory that they take a food photography course. Not that they're going to be setting things up with lights and sets and you know, have a stylist to be able to present the food the right way, but it would help them understand the right way to compose, to light. I mean, you're shooting a, a wedding and I love it when I'll ask a group of wedding, I'll have, I'll have a bunch of wedding photographers in a workshop and I'll say, you know, how many of you do weddings? How many of you like doing engagements? Anybody here doing commercial work or tabletop and no hands go up. And then I've got to remind <laughs> them the toughest tabletop shot in the entire world is a poorly lit bridal cake and the bride, the, the wedding cake is there and the bride wants to be able to see her grandmother's cake knife. Um, yep. that's engraved silver on silver. Yeah, are, exactly. When, when you look at some of the programs you offer, what are, what are some of the ways that, that you've seen that photographers should diversify more in, you know, some logical connections to help not only expand their skill set but grow their business? Well, I think you you look at it in, in such a, an intelligent way because most people think, oh, food photography, I don't do that, or landscape photography, I don't do that. And I'm going, every wedding photographer I know is definitely involved in both those worlds on one level or another. Uh, they really are, and if they aren't yet, they will be soon. So I think I, I find it's kind of my own personal mantra. I love being able to learn how to do new things. And I find that every time I learn a new aspect of photography, any kind of like I can work with someone doing like the food download that we did. So if I can work with a great food photographer like Ed Rudolph, Ed is an incredible unsung photographic god to me. He he does incredible food. He is an, a master at his business. He shoots for a lot of the major brands out there, but he has no desire for anyone to really know who he is. <laughs> but he did a food download with us, and I, I learned so much from him that I've applied to my large set production things. You know, I've applied them to so many different things that I shoot. So I think in that learning process, also a process that helps open us up to other avenues that I think enrich the kind of photography that we do and sometimes opens up thoughts and maybe uh, directions that we would never have thought of before. 
And so we get a little too focused on our, our aspects, you know, the things that we do. I mean, uh, when I worked on the landscape with uh, Shane Walls, I mean, it was he's a master being out there and shooting these just incredible uh, scenics in like national parks. And I'm going, well, the next time I shot up and shot at sunset outside, I applied several of the principles I learned from him in being able to uh, to control the scene in an outdoor location setting. So I think it all ties together. You know, it truly does in a lot of different ways. And it's really it's good material. It's it's material that teaches us how to move forward in our creative journey. Well, and and people that have tunnel vision like that absolutely drive me nuts. In fact, one of the areas I wish we could also get everybody involved in, especially the wedding side of the industry, would be macro. And that kind of leads into a question I want to ask you, because I know you're working with Platypod and Platypod Mm -hmm. is a sponsor of this new series or the the old series that's now been expanded and it's macro and i have seen so many horrible ring shots and every now and then i see one that's really good and i'm excited about the creativity but the macro world is out there and that's another area that i wish more photographers would just just learn to understand so you knew some of the things to do in better lighting you've got two rings there um, or you've got something else you're trying to put the rings and the flowers together. And I know, I don't know if you've seen them, but Platypod has, has come out with these two goosenecks um, that that are stackable. They go on either side of your Platypod. They do not come with the lights that are shown on the website. But I'm just curious about how you've been using some of the ways you've used the Platypod. Because I think that's another way that people can get a better handle on what they should be doing. And macro is one of them. You know, there, you're right. There's so many other things. Well, the reason I love it is uh, just because of ease of use, for one. I carry a small one with me, uh, the Ultra, all the time because if I go out to eat at a restaurant and it's getting close to sunset or something interesting, I t- shoot a time lapse from the table where I'm sitting. I've done that a lot. And it's just fun. I set up my camera, I let it go. You know, um, I, have, I take it up enough of my wife's time shooting all the time that that uh, I try not to make it any more obtrusive than it has to be. But uh, so I use that like that all the time. We hang lights with them because uh, you can shoot a screw into a, a, a telephone pole and I can hang an LED to light an alley, which is a project we're working on right now. Uh, I've done that many times because it's just easy to get them into a tight place and becomes a platform that I can hang a light on. And of course, camera, uh, we've used them for camera, different camera positions in a stove, you know, in a mailbox, in the Christmas tree. I mean, it just gives us a platform where I can get the camera in interesting places. I shoot a lot of video. I teach a lot of video. And my mantra is always wide, tight, and interesting. And so if you don't get an establishing wide shot, if you don't get a tighter shot, so we're getting in and starting to tell a story, then if you don't get an interesting shot, no one's going to watch it. And so the interesting shots are always on the platypod. I love it. Well, it's a really well-made product, and I'm excited to be working. Both Shamir and I are working with the platypod team. So it's it's just a lot of fun, and I know there are a lot of things coming in the future, which is a lot of fun, too. Very exciting. Yes, yes. Well, we're coming up on the end of our time. These always go by so fast. I'm going, really, already? <laughs> right? Well, we want to sneak in one more question. It's actually our favorite question. Now, we've covered a ton of great material on the show, so I feel like you've already answered this question multiple times but i'm going to ask it anyway in case there's something that you think you may have left out do you have any advice for photographers who are just getting started and need to bring their fledgling business up to the next level any advice for them be it education mentoring um what is where should they start well i i really kind of where I start with this kind of a a, a person who's just getting started in the business is Mm -hmm. let's focus on three areas. Let's make sure we have a a strong body of work that represents who you are and where you're at at this time. Let's make sure you're spending 40 to 50% of your time trying to get clients. Mm -hmm. And then let's make sure you're spending time understanding the business and how to make sure that you can keep clients. You can have a, a, just a very healthy business once you have clients. So, but I want them to spend almost half their time getting work and you know looking at the internet and looking at the slanted lens as as much as i love it is not going to get work for you you know and i think we need to focus on those three areas just a solid portfolio for where you're at 
good business foundation for your business, and then really the ability to, to just go out there and find clientele. I, sometimes we find these things in the strangest of ways. I worked with one, one gentleman who's making money doing real estate stuff, and I said, you know what? You are not charging very much every time you go out. And he goes, well, I just can't afford to charge more. And I said, well, give clients an excuse to pay you more money. <laughs> I said, they need an excuse. Give them a 12-hour turnaround, a 24-hour turnaround, a 48-hour turnaround, and, and jump the price every single time for those. And all of a sudden, he was not charging a lot per visit, and he was doing a lot of visits per day. But all of a sudden, most of the people were going for the, the faster turnaround, and it almost doubled what he was making per day. Wow. You know, so understanding the business, understanding how to give people an excuse to give them more money, but then working really hard to get clients is really the foundation. Love it. Speaking of understanding the business, we talked about all your online programs. Where would people go to find the full? Where do you want to send them for the full selection of everything from your online programming to mentoring to anything new you have coming up in the pipeline? Okay, if they go to thuslandlens.com is our website. On there is on our, our online courses, and my mentoring is on there as well. So they go to online courses or mentoring. Uh, we have an online course on business, and that business course has 16 segments that teach different aspects of business from the very beginning to more advanced, and they purchase that. And then with that, uh, once a month, we have a call for an hour and a half, and people call in, and I just talk to the whole group one-on-one, -on -one, and we have great calls with that, you know, and help people to overcome kind of some of the things they're facing. Most people are facing a lot of the same questions, you know, so it works out to be able to be together in that it's like a live one-on-one -on -one call with me once a month when you join that group, and it's a pretty reasonable uh, fee to just get involved, a one-time fee, you have the materials, and you can get on that call for the rest of your life. Well, I don't know, rest of my life, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, this, in the photo industry, even if, even if you've passed on, trust me, photographers out there will find you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There will be there will be no rest. That's true. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll make sure to include those links in the show notes as well so that people That's can excellent. check you out. And Skip, where can folks find you online? Um, it's always the same. It's everything I write is at skipcohenuniversity.com. Uh, you'll also find me Skip Cohen on Twitter, Skip Cohen on Facebook. And just a reminder to everybody, Shamir and I are also having a lot of fun with Platypod and the platypod.com website. You're going to see some changes coming and Platypod on Instagram and Facebook. And Shamira, as always, I got to ask the question, where does everybody go to find yes. you? Folks can find me. They can send me an email at Shamira at photofocus.com. That's my first name, C-H-A-M-I-R-A -A at photofocus.com. We love getting questions, ideas, and feedback because it shapes how we move forward with the show. And we love doing the show. And on that note, JP, we just want to thank you again. You offered excellent advice. Lots of great insight. Very welcome. Very welcome. It was great to be with both of you. It was great to spend some time together. Best of luck in all that you do. You deserve it. Thank you. And we want to thank our listeners for joining us as well. Please tell your friends about this podcast, especially if they want to bring it up to the next level. We look forward to having you with us next time on Beyond Technique, brought to you by Platypod, Photo Focus, and Skip Cohen University.